Oh. Okay, now I can't tell if I'm recording. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm going to let people in. Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. They're filing in. Bonjour. Hello, everybody. Okay, we have to be quiet. I, we, Patty and I see an awful lot of familiar faces. <laughs> Judy, of course. That's Patty. Mark, of course. Mark Jacobs. Uh, We're just going to let you file and uh, get settled. Okay, Patty, are you, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I ended up muting everyone. I, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should let you all talk first and at least say hello. So if you want to do that, say hello, and then we'll get started. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hi. Bonjour. Good morning. Yes, I must admit, I like it when our meetings are a little bit informal and I feel, at least I get the feeling that you're all here in the room with me instead of just on my screen, you know? Um, uh, I've had a separation anxiety for the last year and a half, I suppose everyone has. Mm -hmm. um, I guess now that everybody's in, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is Adrian Leeds. And we're gonna be talking about fractional ownership today. And I guess that's why you're here because you wanna hear everything you need to know about what makes up a great fractional ownership property. So first of all, we are recording this session. We will be making it available and free to whoever wants to watch it. Um, the housekeeping rules are such that, you know, try to just stay muted through the presentation hold your questions for the end or type them into chat, but type them in so that everyone sees the question, not just Patty, because uh, she tends to get a lot of secret messages, <laughs> or so she says. And, uh, and we're gonna try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, it's not always easy, but we're gonna do our best. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna share my screen and my presentation. And that, unfortunately, is the last slide, not the first slide. So let's go fix that. OK, there we go. So nod your heads if you can see it and it looks clear. Great, thank you. So the question is, is fractional ownership right for you? And we're going to talk about what that is. Uh, fractional ownership is not to be confused with timeshare. The primary difference between fractional ownership and timeshare is that in timeshare, you only own the time, the usage time, where it, whereas with fractional ownership, you actually own a portion of the property. Now, in timeshare, usually, you know, you have uh, a large complex in a resort with amenities and you end up even using different spaces, different properties, because it, it usually combines a lot of different properties together so that you can have a lot of flexibility. In this case, this is the joint or co-ownership by a few individuals, which could be as few as two, as many as three whatever, it's endless really, that own in a single property. And the value of the property as well as the shares can be easily determined on the open market. 
Um, just to go back to this, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but fractional ownership started here in the United States with jets. Uh, companies and individuals that own jets that weren't using them full time realized that this might be a really great way to you know, minimize their costs um, and make their usage very efficient. So this has translated now from jets into properties in France. I mean, what could be better? So in this case, okay, how does it work? You've got two or more owners with a, one common objective in one property. And the ownership of the asset is either directly or indirectly through some sort of a legal entity. And in this case, it's through an SCI, which I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit later. Uh, and an, an HOA or a homeowners association. With this comes an agreement on the division of the usage and an agreement on the division of the costs. Now, of course, there's pros and cons. You know, there's good and bad to every situation. Uh, there are many more pros than there are cons. For example, uh, you have a very low cash outlay, outlay because you're only buying a portion of a, of a property. So you're spending a lot less than if you were buying that entire property yourself. You have a, a very high efficiency of use. So if, for instance, you come to France a few weeks a year, um, maybe it doesn't make as much sense to own an entire property yourself, rather than it makes more sense to just have the ownership of the usage you're going to have. So that makes it very efficient. You clearly get a lot more property for your money because if you're gonna only own a share and you're gonna pay for a share, then you certainly don't need to spend many hundreds of thousands of euros on that one property. Uh, in this case, you have no mortgage and you cannot borrow to buy your share unless you take some sort of a line of credit on the US side, but you can't get a mortgage in France. I'm going to explain more about that later, but it's pretty much a cash purchase. Uh, you have no rental issues because in almost all cases, the owners of these properties do not want to rent them out to strangers. So there's no rental of the properties. You've got a situation where all the costs are shared. So that's a huge benefit. And you do have true ownership. So that's another benefit. Um, the cost to sell your share is really just what you pay a lawyer to handle the transaction, which is minimal. So you've got a very low selling cost and you can easily and quickly resell uh, your share. Um, I've sold, uh, I don't know how many shares uh, over the years, uh, probably more than anyone else in this market, and they go very, very quickly. I know that when I advertise a, a, a share for sale, it literally usually gets sold within 24 hours. And then, of course, the property can be sold in its entirety as long as the owners vote unanimously to do that. So you can actually just divest of it in completely. So these are all the benefits. Now, of course, the cons are that you have a limited amount of control. So if, you know, if you're the kind of person that really wants to control everything down to uh, the color of the couch, then this might not be for you. Um, and there is a relative amount of inflexibility, but that depends on the usage calendar, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later also. And there are no real tax benefits to this. You've got no rental income. You can't finance it. And uh, there are management fees because you, pr you have to pay someone to manage the property. But of course, that's shared. If you owned a property outright, you would have management fees anyway. So the truth is that the con on this list of cons, I'm not so sure that's, that's really even relative. Our fractional ownership offerings, the ones that we develop and put on the market, we have a very, very high standard um, because 
I believe that a fractional ownership property has to be a jewel. It has to be in a very desirable location. It has to be very well designed, well decorated and appointed. It has to be a property that is just unlike anything else in its category as much as possible. And that's because, you know, when you're putting a property out there that must be attractive to a number of people, you have to satisfy a lot of people's wish lists. So uh, I, I'd like to make sure that it's really perfect. And I joke that it should be missing nothing, but, and that's personal uh, and our properties just aren't. I also believe that the usage calendar has to be attractive to a very wide variety of owners, that it has to work for as many people as possible. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the legal structure of the property has to be 100% correct. You have to have a good attorney doing this work. The documentation must be complete. It must be, uh, you know, satisfy all the other lawyers that are going to buy into the property. And you want to avoid any conflicts among owners. So this is extremely important. And I will tell you that I know by speaking to the lawyers that specialize in this, that most of the conflicts happen when there are the fewest number of owners. So you put two friends together, for example, and you're probably going to have a whole lot more trouble between two friends than you will among 13 who are, who are not as proprietary. Um, on top of that, you have to have really good quality management so that the property runs smoothly. And what that means is regular housekeeping, regular maintenance, uh, someone's on the ground to make sure everything's in order so that the owners really don't have to do anything at all. And the last item on my personal list is I think owners should be like-minded. I like to try to find people who I know are going to get along with one another, even though they don't see one another because they're not there at the same time, they still have to be like minded so that they have one singular goal in mind and they love the property and they take care of the property and then everybody's going to be happy and there'll be fewer arguments. And this is just our own you know, my personal feeling, this is how we run things here at the Adrian Leeds Group. I cannot speak for other developers. The legal structure is this. Um, first, an SCI is created on the French side, which is a Société Civile Immobilière, and it's basically just a French property company. And that company must have two owners. In this case, the two owners are both nonprofit mutual benefit corporations. There's a main one which has 99% and then there's a subsidiary that has 1%. And it operates like a homeowner association in effect. Now this structure is certainly a little bit complicated. Um, it's, you know, you have to form the corporations. The corporations have to have bank accounts. Then the SCI is in France um, and you, the notaire creates that. It has statutes, which are the laws of the SCI. Someone is um, appointed as the gérant, which is basically the manager of that company. They're the only one, the only person who actually has rights of signing or creating bank accounts and other things. So it's a little bit complicated but um, it's certainly doable. We certainly know how to do it. We're dealing, you know, we set it all up in advance. So you as owners buying into shares in a fractional don't really have to do anything at all. But the bottom line is that as a shareholder, you will own shares in the US corporation. So the shares are bought, bought and sold on the US side. And in our case, we form these corporations in California because California has very liberal timeshare laws that make it easier. So we use the state of California for this purpose. Now we use an experienced and qualified legal counsel uh, so that you know, the documents are basically clean as a whistle. 
And we know this because we have a lot of shareholders who are lawyers and the lawyers go through every word. And um, if it's not to their satisfaction, we're gonna hear about it. So we know that the documents are good. And the purchase and the sale of the shares as well go via the US corporation. As I said earlier, it falls under California law. Now, because it's a share, you can, it can be bequeathed under US law as well. And because it's all done on the US side, the SCI remains unchanged. So that just stays in place throughout, throughout the life of the property. And there's nothing, uh, and when the, SCI, when the SCI doesn't change, then there are no additional notarial taxes and fees on the French side when there is a transfer of shares. There are different kinds of usage plans. Uh, developers use all sorts of different things. There's rotating, there's fixed, there's splits and hybrids. Uh, everybody has you know, the kind of calendar that they think works best. We, of course, like ours best. And um, the one we like is this. It's a 13 four-week shares. So that means there are 13 shareholders. Each shareholder has four weeks of usage and it's a fully rotational calendar. So the way the calendar works is that you have two weeks together and then six months later, you have another two weeks. And then the following year rotates by 10 weeks forward so every year you have two different seasons. It takes 13 years for the calendar to fully rotate so that you're actually in the property on the same weeks, the same two weeks, um, but that would take 13 years to get there. We like to start on Thursday and end on Thursday. And that is because we discovered that the airfares were cheaper when you flew on Thursday. So, uh, and this is because of the experience we have with other properties. And the owners uh, made that change to one of our properties a long time ago and it worked very well for them. Now, what's interesting about this calendar is that you can trade your weeks with other owners at any time. So if you, you can look at the calendar a full 13 years ahead, you know exactly when you're planning to come. And if for some reason that week isn't good for you, you can put a message out to the other owners and ask them if there's anyone who wants to trade their weeks. On top of that, there are often owners who wanna have four weeks at a time. They don't wanna do two weeks in two weeks. So if you place two owners who want four weeks next to one another, all they have to do is trade the two weeks that are adjacent and then they can each have a month. So this gives us a lot of flexib fle flexibility. Um, now, we develop it this way, but it doesn't have to stay this way. Once there is an ownership body of 13 owners, the owners can decide to do anything they want. They can make a change to the calendar. It really doesn't matter to me. It's whatever works for, for you guys. And what we do is choose, uh, well, we create share letters. So you have a letter that relates to your share time. So let me show you what the calendar looks like. Um, I can tell you that we had an awful lot of fun putting this calendar together. And if you take and focus on one color, just pick a color, <clears throat> that's your color. So like for instance, well, <clears throat> excuse me, the one I see first is letter B because it's hot pink and it's hard to miss. So you can see that uh, letter B is gonna start on January 20th and then it's gonna go again to July. And then the year following that, it's going to be in May and in November. So it gives you an idea about how the how your share would work, and it makes it easy to see, you know, when you're going to be using the property. Now, when it comes to share pricing, um, you know, every developer has a different method 
of pricing the shares, but they all end up with something that is close to share market value, which is not at all relative to the mark, the property value, the, you know, of what that property is valued at that time on the market per se. It has to do with the share market value. And, you know, there are a lot of costs associated with developing a fractional ownership property that is not associated with a property owned by an individual. There's a lot of legal work that has to be done that's expensive. Um, because it's such a high quality property, uh, it's going to incur a lot of renovation and decoration costs. And so um, it's, a, it's a different animal than an individual property. Now, the way we price our shares is we price them so that the first four shares are at the lowest price and the second five shares are at an average price and the last four shares are at the highest price. Uh, we like to think of the shares like an addition of art where as the addition is sold out, they become more valuable. So and that's why we price it this way. It also helps us sell the first shares faster. So you want to be one of the first to commit to a, a share so that you pay the lowest price. Now, what happens of, with the first four shares is that they immediately become valued at the next group of shares. And then as those are sold, they all become valued at the highest price. So it really is an advantage to make a commitment early and buy in early. <clears throat> so the purchase process takes some steps. It follows a legal set of rules. There, there are two sets of documents. You receive all the documents. You have to actually wait 14 days from the day you receive them till the day you sign them and send them so that you have the time to do the due diligence. A deposit is sent to an escrow account that is held by the attorney. And then when a minimum number of buyers have completed those steps, then the purchase can be completed. Everyone can send all of their money in, the share certificates are issued, and then your usage begins. So there is at least some consumer protection built in so that you're absolutely sure this is what you want to do. And your deposit, if you decide not to make the purchase, then your deposit is refunded with the exception of a small fee that covers the cost of the escrow account. And all of this is outlined in the documentation. It's all clearly defined. So it's not, you know, uh, you're going to have all of that before you even begin to sign anything at all. The costs of the property are shared among all of the owners, which makes them very minimal. And the costs that are included are the two annual taxes, the tax d'habitation and the tax foncière, which if you don't already know this, they're quite low in France, not about one tenth of what property taxes are in the US. Um, you're going to share in the cost of your utilities, of course, uh, also in the homeowner association charges, which would be the building that the property is in, uh, telephone, TV, and internet, which of course is also part of utilities, the insurance on the property, uh, the housekeeping, and the concierge and maintenance, which we have a concierge who um, makes sure that the property is in perfect condition for every owner. There's a cleaning midstream. So all of that is paid for and shared uh, by the owners. There is some accounting that has to be done, a little bit of, uh, there will be tax returns to be done. All of that is shared by the owners. And the last item is actually a reserve fund. We create a reserve fund that is paid into every year so that regular maintenance can happen. So that let's say 10 years down the road, you need to repaint the apartment. You've got enough money banked in the reserve fund to handle that cost. Replacement of furniture, you know, glassware breaks, things of that nature would come out of that reserve fund. So there is a homeowner association that is formed 
of the one property, the one apartment or home. And in advance of that, the shareholders all agree to the bylaws. Now, we as developers create these bylaws, and then everyone reads the same bylaws, and they have to agree to those bylaws. And if they can't, then, then they shouldn't be buying the property. Uh, the co-owners form their own ownership body, and it is self-governed. So there would be a president, and the initial president would appoint other council members, and then a year down the road, they would all be voted on. And like in any situation, there's usually a couple of people who really like to take charge and who want to take on those responsibilities, and then there are others who don't want to have to do any work whatsoever. And so it, it just kind of naturally happens, we find. Uh, meetings are held annually, but of course they can, be, they can be held as often as you want them to. They can be on Zoom or on Skype, or they can be in person. Uh, one property that I developed uh, several years ago, the owners have become so friendly and, they, and many of them live in Southern California. So they like to actually get together in person and then they hold it also in Zoom so they can have a little bit of virtual and a little bit of personal. Um, so as I said, the officers are first appointed then later elected. The bylaws can be changed later by voting on them. And one of the things that we've done to make it uh, easy to facilitate a communication between owners is we've, we'll create a, a Facebook group that only the owners can participate in, but it's a very easy way of having messages among everyone. If you want to trade your, you know, your weeks, you can just put out a message on the Facebook page and so it, and post photos and whatever. So it's kind of fun and it's easy and simple. If you decide to sell your share, which doesn't happen usually until many years down the road. I mean, most people will use their shares for five to 10 years before they consider selling them. But when they do, uh, first you just have to set your price and we can help you do that by knowing what the value of the price of the share is. And then you first have to make an offer to the other shareholders before before making the offer to the open market. You could probably also sell your share to friends and associates before putting it on the open market. But, and if you haven't by then, we have a really good network. And we, as I said earlier, we sell an awful lot of shares and we've been very successful doing that. We do charge a commission like you would on any property, but um, our, our clients have found that very worthwhile. And then there, of course, there are other sales outlets besides those. There are some small legal costs to the sale of the shares to transfer the share correctly, but it's really nominal and you can add that to your costs. So you should be able to recuperate that. And as I said, we've had pretty much easy and quick sales all along. So you don't have to worry about being able to sell your shares I, you know, as I said, I don't think you're going to want to sell them for quite a while anyway. Our properties are, you know, top notch. We look for desirable locations. We use high quality furnishings. We use a professional decorator, um, mo usually Martin Di Matteo, who's, you know, fantastic designer. We make sure that the bathrooms are luxurious, that the kitchen is contemporary, has new appliances, is fully equipped. All of our properties will have air conditioning. Um, they will have, of course, a, a washer dryer, a flat screen TV, dishwasher. Um, you're gonna have access to, of course, English, la English channels and all of that high-speed internet, phones with free long distance service. And when available, at which is not always possible, we like to have uh, owner storage closets so that you don't have to, um, you know, bring everything and take it all home again. In some of our properties, uh, some of the owners love to cook, they have a big kitchen, and sometimes they have special equipment that they like, so they keep, they keep that equipment in their own owner's closet if they don't want everyone else using it. If you don't care about everyone else using it, then you don't need to put it in your owner's closet. 
Now, here are some of the properties that we are offering. Um, the La Lanterne du Marais, you're probably already familiar with it. We only have two shares left, shares A and D. They are at 101,700 euros a piece. Uh, what you're looking at here is if you see where the do not enter red sign is, the three windows directly above that are basically the property. So it's on the first floor of this building. It's a historic building, used to be a cabaret actually at one time. Um, and we always joked that it must have been a love hotel, which now we know is for sure true because of the cabaret, because this apartment, believe it or not, was at one time five different small uh, lots which were combined and uh, with a hallway. So, you know, we now understand that those were small rooms right above the cabaret. It's located at 8 Rue de Bois de Cecile, which is in the fourth. And if you were in that apartment right now looking out, you would see the carousel at the St. Paul Metro. So you're literally steps from St. Paul. And it's set out a little bit so you can see it has south facing and it has beautiful sun. It's almost 42 square meters. And so it's 41.72 uh, square meters, Lois Carres. And for those of you who don't know what the Lois Carres is, that is the law that specifies um, habitable space. And so certain parts of an apartment are not counted. For instance, if the ceiling's lower than 1.8 meters, then anything um, under 1.8 is not counted as habitable space, for example. Um, this is a very unusual property because when you look at those three windows, the middle window is actually the entrance, the hallway, the stairwell. <clears throat> and the window on the left is where you enter the apartment, which is now the kitchen, because we're rearranging it, we're redeveloping uh, re uh, it. And the window on the right is the bedroom. So it makes a U shape around the central entry. So it makes three complete rooms. So it's, it's unusual in that respect. The bedroom has its own private toilet. There is a separate shower, uh, a bathroom with a shower and a toilet, which is independent. The living room has a sleeper sofa. Um, it is one floor up with no elevator, but one floor is not that big of a deal. Um, but because of the configuration of it and it's spacious as a one bedroom, it means that you can actually comfortably have a lot of people in this apartment and the kitchen is a full size kitchen you'll enter the kitchen. And um, I believe that I have some, this is the interior, but this is a simulation of what it's going to look like. It's being done by Martin Di Matteo. So this is not exact exact, but pretty close to exact. It has a fireplace. Um, what you can't see is the TV that is on the wall opposite the sofa. Uh, <clears throat> it has a tremendous amount of storage. It's all bit with all custom storage work. It has open beams and high ceilings and wood floors. And that's the kitchen that we're working on. So you see the entry door to the left. And as I said, this is a simulation, so it's not exact. There are some things that we're gonna do to it that are gonna make it even better and more beautiful than it is now. But I know with Martine's hand at it, I'm not at all concerned about it being fabulous. And in fact, we're meeting uh, this week to review everything that she's gonna be doing to the property um, we haven't yet signed on it. We're going to be signing on it this week as well. And then the usage starts in January. And that's the bedroom. So that was that third window on the right that you saw. The paintings that you see were done by Pascal Amblard, who's a very well-known Tremploy artist here in Paris. And uh, so they are original works. And the left side is a huge unit of, um, you know, 
closets and storage. And then if you see a handle on the right, that's actually the door to the toilet that's en suite with this bedroom. This is another property. This is a two bedroom called Les Balcons Saint Paul. It's a block away from La Lanterne du Marais. It's uh, also right at the Saint Paul Metro. It's at three Rue Malaire. It's across the street from Breakfast in America and La Favorite. It's almost 70 square meters. It has uh, two bathrooms, one with a large tub and shower, the other with a shower. It has a separate toilet. Um, the master bedroom has twins that can be made up as a queen or as twins. The second bedroom is a small room, a smaller bedroom with a trundle sofa bed in it, uh, which can be pulled out so you can sleep two people there. There's also a sofa bed in the living room, so you can actually sleep up to six. The balconies is a full wraparound balcony that faces both south and east and has absolutely gorgeous views. It's on the fifth floor with an elevator. Um, one level up is owner's closets, which is a big advantage because those were the chambre de bonne, the, serv the servant's quarters that we're turning into closets. There is a cellar and the shares will be priced under 175,000 euros for this property. Uh, this is prime real estate. This is what I call a jewel. And um, this is the current entry of it. It is going to undergo a redecoration, and a, uh, but no real renovation, just a, a bit of a redecoration. And uh, Martine's doing it again. It's going to look, it's already beautiful, but it's going to look even a lot more beautiful than this. This is uh, has a, a wide entry and um, it's just bathed in light with all the windows that wrap around. It's a fabulous property, absolutely amazing. And here's another one. This one is down in Villefranche-sur-Mer uh, on the Riviera. Um, I don't know how many of you out there know this particular town, but it's one of the most beautiful along the Riviera. It has the deepest port, so it's uh, very well known for that. It's uh, famous for the Institut de Francais, which is a language school that does full immersion. And this apartment was very difficult to find because for those of you who know Villefranche, every property is on a different level and there's a million stairs. And uh, we needed to find something that was going to minimize the number of steps that you'd have to take. And we amazingly found it. So it's at number nine Rue Pasteur, which is on the east side of the village. Now, if you look at this photo, um, what you can see is something that looks like an aqueduct, like around center. This terrace is above that. So if, you, if your eye goes above what looks like an aqueduct and you'll see what kind of looks like a for sale sign on a terrace, that's the terrace. And the terrace has the most stunning views. In fact, Patty, Patty's virtual background, wave Patty so they can see you, her virtual background is the view from the terrace of this apartment. Um, the location of it is amazing because you go up a few steps from a beautiful place that has a fountain and a dual staircase. But where that fountain is, is a flat walk that goes, if you go in one direction, you land in four minutes, you land at the train station. If you go in the other direction in four minutes, you land at the main parking lot that's near the Welcome Hotel. And so the, in, the access in and out of this property is very simple with very few stairs. You do go up a few stairs once you enter the doorway and go into the apartment. 
the apartment on the main level of the apartment is a kitchen and the terrace. And then you go down a few steps to a living room with a big picture window, beautiful, the same beautiful view. The kitchen has the same beautiful view. And then on the other side of the living room, dining room is a bedroom that overlooks the, the little place with the fountain and you can hear the water tinkling. It's just absolutely lovely. We are equipping it with twins, which makes into a queen bed as well. We'll have a sofa bed in the living room, so it will sleep up to four. It's a large balcony, 10 square meters. Um, it does face east. The, as I said, the views are drop dead fantastic. And the shares are priced unbelievable, under 85,000 euros each for this property. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Here are some photos. So, this is, you know, what you see from the apartment looking down. This is some of Villefranche. Um, and uh, it's, if you don't know the village, you need to know it. Now, before I move on, um, for those of you who have been following this uh, dialogue about fractionals, you probably know that we were planning on a fractional in Nice called Le, Le uh, Palais du, du Soleil. And um, I was supposed to sign on the property a couple of weeks ago and uh, on a Tuesday and on a Monday, I went to visit the apartment and discovered that the cafe that is the level below has their speakers in the ceiling and you could hear the music from the cafe permeated the entire apartment. So we canceled the music. I'm sorry, what Patty? feel the music. You could feel it, you could hear it. So we canceled the purchase, which was very disappointing because uh, mm -hmm. it was a, just a beautiful property and it would have made an amazing fractional if that had not been the case. So we're now on the lookout for another jewel, which is not easy to find, but we will have no fear, we will find it. Um, I also am in progress on another property, another uh, property that in Nice, in Paris, excuse me, which right now is a large studio, but will be a, a small one bedroom also in the Marais in the fourth district. And when we get more information about that, we're going to be sharing that with you as soon as we get it. So the question is, is this right for you? And if it is, and you want to visit these properties, then here's the link. Patty will put this link in the chat as well so that you can copy and paste it. Yep. So that's where you find it on our website. And you can always email us at info at adrianleads.com for more information. And now you can ask me anything. So I'm going to stop the screen share. And now I can see all of you. And for those of you who have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I guess Patty's been monitoring that. Monitoring that. Okay. And we've got a couple questions about foreign owners, basically non-American owners. Are there any issues related to that? No, it just means that they're gonna buy shares in a US corporation. Doesn't really matter where they come from. And whether or not there are tax implications. Uh, in what respect is the question. Um, so we, we have lots of Australian, New Zealand owners, for example, in some of our other properties. That's not at all unusual. Um, you pay the taxes on the property by virtue of, you know, the as the co-ownership pays them. But taxes by whom for what? can't imagine. Other than that, other than the property taxes in France, there are no other tax obligations. Um, we have a question about the um, Balcon St. Paul about the pricing. Did you talk about that? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Under yes, under 175,000. Okay. The shares we don't know the exact pricing of the shares. Um, because I'm still waiting for all of the costs to come in. But we have a rough estimate. 
Okay, another question is, does the property have to be fully sold before it is used? No, absolutely not. Um, basically, the developer holds the other shares. They own the other shares. So the property can be used um, at any point. When it, when it launches, it launches. All of these properties are gonna launch in January of 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me find some more here. Or if anybody wants to ask, feel free to unmute and ask while I'm reviewing other questions. Well, let me say this very quickly also, and I see Mark Jacobs has his hand up. Um, <laughs> some people want to make commitments on these shares very early, even before we announce the prices and before we announce and before we have something to even show. And we do have pre-sale contracts available. We asked our lawyer to do this, that... Um, they make more of a commitment to us than they do to you, in effect, because you'll be able to pull out of that commitment at any time. But it means that you can secure your share. So we will be making those contracts available. Okay, Mark. Um, two quick questions. Is the management of the property kept with your group or is it an outside management company? And the well, second question is um, just a little bit more about choosing the share letter. So when you get to the point of choosing the share letter, does that mean you're guaranteed a share whether or not you get that letter or you are guaranteed the letter you choose, which seems a little random, which seemed a little I, random I, I to guess, us. I get it. Okay, question one. Uh, basically, I have an in-house person who um, has been a concierge for many, many years and uh, worked for me when we were doing rentals. And she is an independent. So we have basically hired her to do this work. Now, once the ownership body's in place, they can fire her and hire somebody else. We don't care. You know, once it's out of our hands, the owners can do whatever they want. Um, you know, and as long as they're happy with her, then you can continue. But she is an independent, so she doesn't charge, you know, high fees like a company would, for example. And she knows the properties really well and is very capable. So I have no issue with that. Now, as far as choosing your share letter, the faster you get in, the more choice you have. Okay? So if you're the first one to choose, then you have... A through whatever it is, M at K L. What's what's the last one? I think it's M. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, a through M. Okay. Um, believe it or not, in the what happened with the Lantern was so amazing. We had no conflicts. No. It was incredible. People just somehow managed to choose shares that were not uh, committed to by other owners. It was amazing. It just worked out and it seems to work out this way. Yeah. It, it's it's kind of an incredible thing, but of course the faster you get in, the better. It was the same thing with Mames on Miron. We had no conflict at all. That's how we know that it's gonna be a good ownership body too. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. Um, but when you've reached the point, when you've reached the point of choosing a share, does that mean you're at least guaranteed a share? Oh, whether or sure. not there's a conflict. Sure. Okay. okay yeah, right. when you when you make a commitment no, and you are. put it and you put a deposit down, <laughs> then you are guaranteed a share. No. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I see hands up here from Glenn Glendalyn mm -hmm. Pottinger. That's me. Okay. Uh, can you give can you give me an idea of the uh um well, two things. First of all, the, pro the uh, how much of a deposit you, re you require if you start the process. And then the uh, second question, you talked about this pre-commitment um, uh, form, pre-sale pre form. Uh, how do you, how would we receive one of those? All you have to do is basically email us and say that you'd like to make a commitment on a particular property and we will send you the form. So it's, okay. it's really easy. Okay. Okay. And your first question, though, was uh, remind me. Sorry. 
the uh, 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 for an approximate idea of what the deposit, the amount of uh, the well, deposit? The deposit is actually determined by the developers, and um, we tend to make it about 10%. Right. Okay. Yeah. But okay. Again, until we get all this formulated on these properties, we won't know it until we, you know, we, we won't, we won't know that for a okay. bit. Okay. 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 And we've got a couple questions about the housekeeping. Okay. And how it's handled when one owner's leaving, another own owner's arriving. So there's a check in time and a check out time, just like there is with any kind of a rental property or a hotel, which enables the housekeeper to come in and clean. And a related question is our housekeeping services daily or at end of stay? Well, it's usually once a week, but if an owner wants to have a housekeeper every day, they can choose to do that and pay for it themselves. Right. It's that simple. We do have a couple of people with their hands up too, Patty. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, Danielle Dukowitz. Uh, hi, Adrian. Hi, Patty. Thanks. This is really interesting. Um, a question about, oh, this is kind of intriguing that if you get in early, it's less expensive if you're in the first, third. What are those differentials? And how do you have to be, you just spoke about something, what did you call it? Like a pre-purchase share? A pre-sale a pre contract, yeah. A pre-sale contract. You have right. to do one of those things to kind of guarantee one of the earlier or the- Well, I would recommend it. If you're seriously interested, then don't wait, you know? Um, we just saw that there was so much interest that we needed to do that. Now, I will say that the developer determines the prices. Um, in the case of Lanterne, we were so sure that we were going to sell the shares so quickly that we made the differentiation very small. In other words, there's not a lot of difference between the three levels. In a property where we're not as confident about the sales, we're going to price it more aggressively. So it's real. It's it's marketing, is what it is. Yeah, it's marketing. Yeah, no, it's clever. It's marketing. Okay, I admit it. <laughs> or it's incent. It's, it's incentivizing. It. Okay. It's, in it's no incentivizing. Right. It's incentivizing. So you're saying that the these ones that are coming up now might be a larger difference. No, they might be a. We have so much interest that I have a feeling there's not going to be a lot of differentiation. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Okay, now I also see Derek Curran's hands been up for a while. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Adrian. Um, I am thinking of this, um, you know, we talked about this recently together uh, as potentially an investment. And so I was hoping you could speak to how any appreciation is calculated when a shareholder does wish to sell and maybe just a ballpark of what the additional costs are on the purchase end and then the sale end, like closing costs and, you know, the legal fees and the commission that you mentioned earlier. So on the um, purchase end, there are no closing costs. Okay. That's Zero. it. What you see is what you get share price. Yes. Right. There are no closing costs. Mm -hmm. On the sale end, it's really whatever the lawyer says he's going to charge you. My hand again. Someone mm -hmm. needs to uh, to mute. I don't, I don't You're hearing someone. Way. Glendalyn, I think you're maybe yeah. still unmuted. I don't know. Yeah, somebody. A, a couple of people are. Um, okay, thank you all for muting. Um, so. Uh, oh God, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, Darren. Uh, whatever the lawyers say the lawyer, is what I call it. Whatever you're, and we work with the same lawyer. Um, he, you know, he's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he charges a fair amount. And yeah. when you get that figure, you can build it in like yeah. our commission, we charge a 5% sales commission and you can build that into the price. We have never sold a share at a loss. It's always been at a profit. You okay. see, and the yeah. earlier you get in, the more guaranteed your profit's gonna be. Okay, great. And then I had also asked just, I mean, I think this is just voted on. Things like smoking, if they're, that's allowed in the balcony and bring your furry friends along, the no owners. Smoking, no, okay, generally speaking in the bylaws, we know 
that most people prefer not to have pets, not to have smoking. Now, a group of people could get together and decide to do their own fractional who are smokers and have pets, but we as developers have to create bylaws that we think are more universally acceptable. And so that's what we do. Now we do have one case where um, one owner in one of our properties has a pet that is a, um, what do you call it? Uh, a service animal. Some sort of a service animal. Service right. animal. Right. And we actually cannot deny that. And, okay, good. and so we have one situation where it's one owner um, and we just we can't deny it. Okay, thank you. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yes, very. Okay. Um, <laughs> Gesundheit, please mute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rena, Rena Shagan, I think you have a question, right? Yeah, yes. Um, Adrian, do you yet have up on your site um, a floor plan for um, Les Balcons Saint Paul? No. You're going to see all that when we, at one time. I don't want to put out a lot of piecemeal information. Okay. Right. However, okay, I can describe it to you. Okay. <laughs> Because you enter this big, beautiful foyer, and immediately to your right is bedroom number one. And uh, then the door to bedroom number two is a little further down. And the, there is a bath, uh, you know, what do you call that? A Jack and Jill bathroom where you have, you have access to a bathroom from both of the bedrooms. But it's the one with the shower. If you continue down the foyer, to the okay. left is a big independent bathroom, a very luxurious, big tub, all that. And if you go straight ahead, you land in the kitchen, dining room, living room that has the wraparound balcony. So it's, it's quite a nice floor plan, actually. Works very well. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, let's see. Tom Connert. Okay, um, it doesn't sound very easy to try and bring your pets along to any of these from what I'm, from what I'm hearing here. Uh, we do travel with our two small dogs, but it doesn't sound like it's very easy. You're gonna need your own apartment, Tom. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. that's okay. Yeah, because in general, you know, some people are allergic, sure. right? Um, and pets do create problems on occasion. We love our pets, but they're not. Our pets would perfect. never do that. Our, yeah, right, our, right. Our, I, we know, <laughs> right. <They're pretty laughs> but, um, no, the, we have to admit that's a, that. That's okay. I understand that. That's the way it works. Sure. Exactly. Well, so, that's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beth Renstrom. Beth. Hi, know? Adrian. Yep, sorry, we had to unmute. Um, question about what do you see typically from a management fee perspective? So I know it'd be different, one bedroom, two bedroom. Yeah, it would be different. But what are some of the existing cost. management fees well, on a yearly basis? Actually, Patty, just make, tell me if this is right. I think at Lanterne, the annual dues, I think are 1600 plus a small reserve fund. Is that right? Um, Sounds in the ballpark I'm looking. I think it was on my. No, spot annual end. dues are actually closer to two thousand. On the Lanterne? Yeah. But that's with the reserve fund. Oh, that's with the reserve fund. That includes the reserve fund. Yes. Right. So the reserve fund is still your money. It's held on account. When you right. sell the share, the buyer it actually refunds that to you. Right. So it's not lost. So yeah, I think it was like 1600. By the way, just so you all know, it is now 659. This is a one hour event. Okay. If you want me to keep going, I will be happy to keep going for another 10 or 15 minutes. So I see some yeses out there. 
Because we still have, we have a whole bunch of questions. I'm sure we do. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I can keep up with the questions. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's go for another 15. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, now, now, it's a good question. I have a question about um, why can you not deduct property taxes on the second or third home? Uh, you mean, can you deduct them on your U.S. tax returns? Right, right. You know, that's a really interesting question. I don't know that anybody bothers with it. The taxes are so low that it's hardly worth worrying about. You know, right, uh, the tax of the annual taxes on these properties is probably going to be total about a thousand or a thousand to two thousand euros. Well, on long share. term per owner, the taxes are only like a hundred and ten euros. <laughs> so it's sort of like that's don't worry like, about it. <laughs> yeah, right. It's so small. It's Let so it small. Right. It's it's a very small amount. Yeah, exactly. Um, I did see a question with someone wanted to know if we were going to do plans for something on the uh, left bank, sixth, seventh, or fifth. Um, it just depends on if I were to find a property that I thought was a jewel for one thing. It's, uh, I, I'm doing five projects at one time right now. So we're a little bit insane from that. I don't have anything planned, but there are other developers who kind of specialize in those locations. So at the moment, the answer to that is no. Um, okay, what else? We have a couple of questions about liability. Like if some owner causes damage to the apartment. Uh, there's a security deposit that you will also pay that is also held in your name for uh, damage, just like on a rental property. Right, and on liability too, somebody else has asked about, are the cleaners insured? Um, are the housekeepers insured? Well, that depends on your management. The management is who's going to hire the housekeeper. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you as an owner or an ownership body uh, would require that the housekeepers be insured and licensed and everything else, then, then that is something the owners would decide to do. Um, there's another question about, and we just covered this briefly when we talked about taxes. Are any of the purchase funds dedicated to the initial funding of the reserves? Ask, the, the, question, ask the question again. Are any of the purchase funds dedicated to the initial funding of the reserves? No. The no, reserve there's fund, The reserve is, fund is paid for uh, every year. There's a small amount that each owner puts into the reserve fund. So it builds over the course of the years so that you have enough money to actually do the things you need to do the, to the property. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let me see what else. I uh, see one question where the, do the annual fees go up year after year? And again, you are self-governing. So mm -hmm. a budget is created initially then the ownership body uh, will review the actual expenses. And if the budget needs to be increased or increased, then the owners would vote on that. If you've ever lived in a multifamily uh, you know, building, which we all do in Paris, of course, all of our buildings have home homeowner uh, associations. It runs exactly like that. It, it's just the only difference is it's one property, not a lot of different units. Okay, what else? Adrian, do you ever do um, fractional shares on properties that are not in apartment buildings that, you know, maybe have a swimming pool or something like that born of a, a village location? Um, well, we, we have not done that yet. I am working with someone um, to potentially develop a property in the south of France. Um, we just find that they're, um, harder to sell 
they take longer to sell because fewer people are interested in country properties. It's really, it's really all about, you know, demand. And it is harder to deal with them and they cost more money to maintain and, um, uh, but it does happen. Now, if you have a group of people who want to do a property in the countryside, you could come to us and we would help you develop it. We can do that. But it would be good if you already had a lot of the owners because as I said, this is a business, okay? You have to understand, this is, this is a business undertaking and you have to be prepared to sell the shares that you, you know. So you could say, I wanna be an investor and come to me and I'd help you uh, be the investor and develop the property and you could reap the rewards of that and some usage. In fact, um, on the Lanterne property, uh, I have a partner in that and he came to me because he wanted a share. And then he said, but you know what? I'll invest in the property. I'll, I'll keep one share for myself and we'll sell the rest. And that's what we're doing. So that's entirely possible. Now, when I do this though, um, I make it very clear that I need, a, I need a good partner. I need a partner who understands that this is a business and that you might not be able to decorate it exactly the way you wanna decorate it as if it was your personal home because it has to appeal to other owners. So as long as you really have an open mind, to, a mind about this, then it can work great but you definitely have to understand that in effect, it is a business. I don't recommend uh, fractionals with only a few owners, only because they do have the most problems. You know, even if two friends get together and decide they wanna buy a property together, those are the ones that have the most problems because usually it's two friends who haven't thought to put together bylaws haven't thought to work out an exit plan, you know, and they, then they end up getting themselves into all sorts of disputes and they end up not being friends. So it's, you got to be really careful. And I've seen it happen and it's not a pretty picture. So I want you to be really careful when you start thinking about doing things like that. Okay, Adrian, there's a couple other questions about what do the neighbors think when these owners are coming and going every two weeks. <laughs> um, I don't really care what they think. You can, you know, they're owners. Um, this is, right. we're not renters. This is not Airbnb and they can't do anything about it. So the thing is you make friends with the neighbors, you bring them a bottle of champagne and um, then they'll be fine. We have not had any problems in our other buildings because owners take care of property. They're not like renters. And they usually make friends with the building. If there's a guardian in the building, for example, uh, make friends with the neighbors. And then everybody seems to get along just fine. Seems to, it seems to work out. It's amazing. I see one question where, can you let family members use the property? Absolutely, yes. You can let your friends and relatives use the apartment, but you are taking responsibility for that. And um, usually there is a required meet and greet by the concierge if you have someone new entering the building because entering the apartment because we want to make sure that you know how to use all the appliances and all of that stuff. If you've ever rented a, a, a short-term rental apartment, it's like the same situation. Very, very similar. Okay. Um, I see another question is when you buy a share and you choose A, C, or F, are, are there any differences? It just depends on the calendar, but they rotate. So no, there's no real differences. Just, Adrian, just, one more question. I think you said earlier there's no subletting. Is that right? No subletting. You cannot yes. rent okay. it. No. Gotcha. You can let your friends and relatives use it. Now, if your friends pay you something, okay, on the side and nobody knows about that, then obviously you can get away with it, but you have to take responsibility. And we didn't hear that from you. 
<laughs> I'm book? just saying. <laughs> um, Adrian, another question is if repairs are needed and the reserve fund is, is insufficient. Um, and there would be an assessment. Right. But right. of mm -hmm. course there'd be an assessment. Okay, so let's let's for example, let's say that the building, okay, the um, building itself is has to do a ravalement, which is the resurfacing of the building then the unit, the, the property is going to pay its share for that and you might end up with a special assessment. But you, you know, if you owned it on your own, you'd have the same story. So at least you're sharing it with 12 other people. Um, and there's another question about who creates the budget for the apartment? Ah. Patty and I create the budget. <laughs> <laughs> However, that's only the first year. That's only the first right. time. But that's because we know what the costs are going to be as, as much as we can know. And then when you see the actuals, then the homeownership body would then rebudget based on the actuals. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, what else? We got, it's 7 it's seven eleven. We have, okay. uh, <laughs> let's right. call it four more another, minutes. Another question is, can an owner sell their share for far less than it is valued? Why would you do that? Of course you can. You can sell it for anything you want, but I don't, wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, you can sell it for anything. You want to give it away, have fun. Who cares? Okay. What else? Does the price of a share go up historically? Well, the price of the shares go up with the value of the property as well as the value of the shares on the market. So what happens is when we have an owner who comes to us and says, we want to sell our share, um, we do a little bit of do, you know, due diligence and uh, make a recommendation on price. That's how it works. Just, just like any piece of property, it's the same thing. No different. Okay, here's a here's a good question. What happens if one of the owners doesn't pay their yearly share, their yearly dues? Oh, deadbeat owner. <laughs> okay, deadbeat owner is the same situation with a big building. Um, Basically, you would possibly, if you couldn't get them to pay up, you'd have to, the organization would have to sue them in some way to recuperate it. And everyone else would be, you know, putting in more money to cover the loss. Um, I've never seen it happen. You know, I've, I've just never seen that happen. That doesn't mean it won't. But it's a reason why you want like-minded owners that have, you know, are responsible. Okay, um, Wanda has her. Wanda Dabrowski has her hand up. <laughs> yeah, because um, that was my question about reselling the share um, for less value. It's I, like obviously, yeah, nobody would want to do that. I'm thinking about if somebody was in economic trouble, and they were just wanting to get rid of their share. Can they do that? You said yes, but my, the other part of my question was, how does that affect the value of the shares of the other owners? Well, if it's already been sold out and they sell their share uh, at a low price, it really shouldn't affect the other owners at all. That is up to them. It's like any, you know, if a house goes on sale for a lot less in the neighborhood than the others, right? It doesn't really overall affect the value of the property in that neighborhood, maybe slightly, mm -hmm. But, um, and it does happen, but again, I, you know, most, mostly people are not reselling their shares for five to 10 years. I mean, hey, Adrian. Adrian, this hi, is Allie. your neighbor. I know. Hi. How are you? Um, uh, the question regarding the deadbeat owners. Um, I just want to, uh, it's a common in the question, in the, in the U.S., the HOA can enforce foreclosure on that owner if, if they do not pay their uh, share. How, how does that work in France? 
could we? Well, this actually isn't in France because the shares are held on the U.S. side. So it's actually U.S. law. Okay, how about the HOA rules and regulation? Is that is that the U.S. or? or, or no, it's U.S. French? It's U.S. The bylaws are based in U.S. Yes, yes. Um, I would have to bone up on uh, the bylaws. There probably is a clause in there. You can imagine they're many, many pages long. There probably is a, something that addresses that issue. Um, and I, you know, if it's one year worth, one year's worth of dues, you probably wouldn't foreclose. If it started to get more serious, it might be different. But um, uh, as I said, I've just never seen it happen. That doesn't mean it wouldn't. I'm sure that it could. Okay, is that something that it could be addressed in the bylaws moving forward, or or, or the owners? Well, it can... probably is, and I just have to look for it. Patty, will you make a note to do that? I just did. Yeah, yeah I just okay. did because I don't know them well enough to know if that's in there. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty heavy document, and I have we have been through it thoroughly, but. Um, uh, but that is remember it all. Issue. Can remember it all. all right. yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're at 716 now. I, I think we should say so long. I hope that this has been helpful to everyone. Um, if you have further questions, then feel free to email us at info at adrianleads.com. Uh, visit the website, look at the properties. You will be hearing more about them as we have more information. If you're seriously interested now in any one of the properties we've talked about, um, then, you know, definitely let us know. And I want to mention there's only two shares left of La Lanterne. Yes. Share A and Share D, I believe. Yeah, it so, was on that slide. So and this is, up. and we have a wonderful group of owners. Um, this is a yeah. fabulous piece of property. Some are here and, with us. Hmm? What? Some of, those, some of the buyers at La Lanterne are with us tonight. Oh, wonderful. So that's good to know. Okay. Yep. yep. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone. This is being recorded. We will be making this available so that you can share it with your friends. You can watch it again if you want to. And, um, and I want you guys to have a wonderful rest of weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Ladies. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.